<clears throat> okay, um, let's get started. So good afternoon. Uh, so we're going to continue our discussion of the um, this rather remarkable topological state. It's a gap state of some uh, spin system or a boson system, um, which was first realized by Kitev in an exact resolvable model. Uh, but we are considering a more general framework. Uh, we're not going to solve it exactly, but try to capture the essential features by, uh, you know, by an approximate calculation. Uh, the exact solution, in fact, in this notation corresponds to uh, G exactly equal to zero uh, in the solvable model on the honeycomb lattice, uh, and the rest is very similar. So the basic features of the model that uh, we need to focus on is first of all, this is a, a system that looks like it's about to get uh, Z2 topological order, or, you know, phase that we understand very, very well, having met it many times in different contexts. Uh, and in fact, even in Kitev's honeycomb model, that's what happens for a certain set of parameters. Uh, in fact, for most of the parameters, it is a Z2 spin liquid. So we just write down some simple effective theory for the Z2 spin liquid. Uh, where you have a, some a Z2 gauge theory whose fluxes describe the Wisons. And, and this is coupled in a gauge invariant manner. Uh, you know, so the gauge transformation, just to remind you, yeah, are here. So the F goes to plus or minus F, with rho is plus or minus one, and the Zs go this way. So any, any terms that uh, are invariant under this transformation are allowed. So we just write down the simplest set of terms that are invariant under this. Uh, and so you can get fermion hopping terms uh, and uh, and fermion pairing terms. Also, another important feature is that we have, we don't have any spin index here, uh, and that's because we're assuming we are in a system with strong spin orbit coupling. Uh, so we just ignore the spin index here because it gets all mixed up anyway. Uh, and uh, that's a simplification, and uh, but it's an important feature that if you have if you don't have spin orbit coupling, then you won't get the remarkable features that we're about to focus on. Okay, any questions? Also, I think uh, you had a discussion yesterday uh, on uh, on various solutions of uh, this kind of Hamiltonian, where you think of these Fs as actual electrons and you don't have the Z2 gauge fields. Uh, and then this describes what's called a P plus IP superconductor. Uh, and under the right conditions where the band uh, of the Fs has a churn number, um, you find an edge state, uh, which we also discussed last time. And I, I believe how you gave you a more explicit derivation of how the edge state appears, a Majorana, chiral Majorana edge state. All right. Anybody have any questions before I launch into the rest of the discussion? All right, so what we want, so I, we talked about the global minimum, uh, you know, what's supposed to describe the ground state. And roughly speaking, the ground state is a configuration where we, first of all, ignore the fluctuations of the Zs, uh, and we take a zero flux configuration uh, in, in which all the Zs are plus one, say. Uh, and then, then we uh, say, let's look at an excited state. And of course, our favorite excited state in a Z2 spin liquid uh, is a Vison. So you have a Vison where only one plaquette has a flux of minus one, and all other plaquettes have a flux of plus one. And now our task is to just solve uh, this, find the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, uh, which is a general form of what's called the BDG Hamiltonian, the Bogdanov of Dijen Hamiltonian, uh, for the case where Zij uh, has this configuration. So that's the problem we're going to now address. Okay, so we're going to, so if you look up Kitev's paper in Appendix C of the paper, um, he treats exactly this problem in a very general, powerful, mathematical way. Uh, where uh, he's, you know, proves various theorems, looks at various topological invariants, and from that concludes that as long as the Wisons are well separated from each other, 
uh, each Y zone has a Majorana of zero mode uh, near its uh, near it. You know, it's not clear what the spatial form is, but there will be such a zero mode. Uh, so I, you know, it's a, um, you know, it's a very clearly written argument, and I urge you to read it. But it's rather mathematical in its nature. Uh, what I will present uh, is uh, just a, a simplification, highly simplified situation where we can also see this and you get the general idea. Okay, so once you have a, a, a Y-zone like this, then you no longer have a translational symmetry. Uh, and so now we have to diagonalize this by uh, some kind of Bogolyubov rotation uh, and reduce this to some uh, canonical diagonal form. So without explicitly working out what that diagonal form is, uh, I can make some general statements, uh, which is what we, where we ended last time. So I basically I'm going to do a Bogolyubov rotation, as in this equation 22, between the lattice fermions and some new fermions. Uh, these are just regular fermions, just like these are regular fermions, they're complex fermions, uh, which are called eta. So you go from the F fermions to the eta fermions. Uh, and because of, we had the spinless fermions, in fact, the uh, the Fs, the set of Fs appear here are the same as the set of uh, F daggers that appear here. They refer to the same set of states. Uh, and you expect that to be the, to be to remain the case after any bugly bar rotations. So this is something you can prove by just looking at the general form of the Hamiltonian. Uh, you know, the Hamiltonian has some form like this. Uh, it has a, some, uh, some matrix here in, uh, in the particle hole space, another matrix here with a minus sign, and a matrix delta over here. Uh, and this is the emission conjugate. Uh, so you just take a general matrix like this and look at its eigenvectors which uh, in some eigenvector form will have some u's and v's that we have met. Uh, and just by playing around with this eigenvalue equation, you can prove the claims I'm making. Uh, one, one claim being that uh, the set of eta's that appear here are exactly the daggers of the eta's that appear here. Okay. Uh, the second claim is that the eigenvalues appear in equal and opposite pairs with opposite signs. So if there's an eigenvalue Epsilon of this uh, Bogilbev Dijan Hamiltonian. This is PDG. Uh, the, if there's an eigenvalue epsilon s, uh, there's also an eigenvalue minus epsilon s. Uh, and in terms of these etas, the final Hamiltonian, the BDG Hamiltonian for any zij, uh, can be written in this form. So there are, uh, if you have n, uh, sorry, if you have m sites then the total number of fermions, eta fermions, which are still complex, are, is also m. Uh, and when eta is occupied, so the eta dagger eta becomes one, then the eigenvalue is plus epsilon s. And when it's unoccupied, the eigenvalue is minus epsilon s. Okay. And the total number of states um, is, uh, is two to the m. Uh, because you have M fermions and each fermion can either be empty or occupied. Okay. So, and that gives you two to the M state. So this is a, it's really a many body system. Uh, and even though it looks like a free fermion Hamiltonian because of this uh, F dagger, F dagger term, uh, you're allowed to change the total number of fermions uh, and, and really have to think about it more in the many body, many body sense. So in the many body spectrum has two to the M states which I'll just keep completely specified by this Hamiltonian here. Okay. So in the ground state, um, the eta fermions uh, will all be occupied. They'll occupy all the negative energy states and uh, as far as the eta fermions are concerned, and they will not occupy the positive energy states. All right, so now the claim is the following. That if I take a Vison, there's a picture of this somewhere. If I take a pair of Vison, here we go. 
So you have, uh, these are the values of the epsilon s that I'm plotting here. So they're, they're equal and opposite. Uh, and they're, they're usually they're up, you know, behind some gap, uh, above some gap or below some gap uh, inside. Yeah, okay, they're equal and opposite, and then they're spread out in yeah, this gap region here. But when you have two y zones uh, and you move them apart, as they go apart, a pair of states will peel off. Exactly one state will come down from here. And exactly, and of course, because they have to be particle all symmetric, uh, exactly one state would peel off from here. And as you take it really far apart, these two will come closer and closer and closer, and in fact, become uh, go to zero exponentially fast. So what you'll find is that the splitting here, the splitting is e to the minus l, where l is the uh, uh, spacing between the y zones and times the gap delta, roughly speaking with some factors of some velocity thrown in. Uh, so it becomes it's essential. So we as we want to look at the limit where this thing is practically zero. So that's when we're going to be able to use this thing for, uh, in principle, for some quantum computing or some uh, topologically protected manipulations of qubits uh, when the spacing essentially becomes zero. And the fact that it's exponential is great because it's easy to get an exponential uh, to be very small. Okay. So, so now, so here's the point that this pair of levels uh, describes two visons. Okay. So there's some there's this very special eta uh, that I'm now going to focus on. We'll call it eta zero if you want. Uh, so that particular fermion is uh, associated with two uh, with two visons. So now I can ask, what is the wave function of this fermion? Uh, what you would expect is it's got a peak near the first vison and another peak near the second vison. Um, what's remarkable uh, is that the two peaks are, in fact, it's Majorana components. And that's what we have to now establish. So here's the claim then that the fermion, this very special fermion, which is being peeled off by the presence of these two vortices, uh, you know, okay, that itself is, you know, somewhat surprising, but not very shocking. Uh, so you have this very special vison, which I call eta zero. So, so let me just decompose eta zero into its real and imaginary parts. So gamma one and gamma two are some Majorana operators that we introduced last time. And then the Hamiltonian is just I gamma one, gamma two times a number, which is very, very tiny. Uh, but now the claim is that, uh, I think I started to write that down last time. But uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an important enough claim that I should write it down again. Uh, so you have these two operators, gamma one and gamma two, that I have created out of the complex fermion uh, that associated with a pair of uh, vortices. Uh, okay, so where am I? Okay, so here I have a vison here. Um, I have one vison over here and another vison really far away. Um, and in the vicinity of these visons, I have, you know, various F, I have a bunch of sites, and on the sites, I have the operators Fi and Fi dagger. And in the vicinity of this vison, I also have, let me call them Fj and Fj dagger. So, so my claim is that the, the gamma one associated with vison one is some linear combination of fi, uh, you know, with some coefficient ci plus, uh, it'll turn out to be complex conjugate, uh, fi, sorry, no, I'm not writing this right. fi, fi dagger. So the ci are not operators, uh, let me call them, well, okay, I said that's, the ci are, are just numbers. 
So there's some set of numbers and the operator gamma one in general without any uh, assumption is some linear combination of the F and the F dagger. That's simply the statement of the Bogley bell rotation. But the, uh, the, the statement is that these numbers CI uh, are basically localized in this region. So in this region, CI is not equal to zero and it's practically zero elsewhere. And in this region, uh, let me call them DI, there's another set of DI which are not equal to zero. Uh, and uh, gamma two is a linear combination of uh, di times fi plus di star times fi dagger. So, so in, in, so in a very real physical sense, the gamma one is sitting on one uh, uh, one vortex, and the gamma two is sitting on the other vortex. Uh, and now, since I have the, in principle, the physical ability to move these vortices in the lab. I can actually do some operations on the gamma one and gamma two. Uh, and that's those are the operations that we now want to describe. Okay, so let me now uh, give you a short proof of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus a zoom in onto one of them uh, and call that the origin of coordinates. So we're going to take some coordinates here. So this is going to be our coordinates, the X and Y axis. This is X and Y. Uh, but we're going to take a point in here and describe it in polar coordinates, R and theta, where this is theta. Okay. And another thing, important thing I should keep in mind, uh, that's what's holding the whole thing together and which will lead to the remarkable properties, uh, is that there's a branch cut that's connecting these two. So this is the you know, the branch cut uh, in the ZIJ. So Z is everywhere, one except when it cuts this line. All right, so now it, I want to just, I'm going to send the other wise on to infinity, uh, and I'm just going to focus on the BDG equation in this region, okay? So the BDG equation now, uh, is not transplacement invariant, so it doesn't make sense to to write it in the momentum space, but we can write it in real space. So you know we have we have the BDG equation previously the uh, the BDG Hamiltonian. Uh, well, let me. I hope I remember it. Uh, it's uh, so it's some chemical potential here and minus mu, and the important point is that it is. Uh, delta times px at small x at small momentum px plus ipy, and here is delta times uh, px minus ipy. So this this thing in in the translation invariant case uh, acts on the momentum eigenstate. But now we're going to write it in uh, real space, and that's easy. It's going to be mu times delta times d by dx plus i d by dy, okay, and I have some i missing here, uh, and the complex conjugate minus mu. And now this is going to act on some wave function, uh, and we just want to solve it in with in the presence of this branch cut. Okay, and that turns out to be quite simple. So, so this is the real space form of it that I just wrote down. Uh, and I think you've seen some analogs of this in section yesterday when we were talking about the edge states. So the chemical potential I assume is uh, varying with R. And the, the, the only thing I require is that mu become positive as you move away from the core of the vortex. Uh, and delta could vary with R. You can find a solution for general delta of R. And then this is just, this, co this combination here is just D by DX plus ID by DY. So now I want to solve, get the eigen functions of this Hamiltonian. Uh, so it's going to act on some wave function, psi of r and theta, which will be a two component wave function. Uh, but the most important point uh, is that there's this branch cut. Uh, so, so we can solve this equation and you'll get some eigenvalues. Uh, but what, uh, I don't know who was the first to note it, but it was something analog of this was certainly well known in the uh, helium T literature, and I think Volovic uh, is often mentioned as the person who first noted this, but there may be others. Um, so what we're going to find is that in the presence of this branch cut, 
that there is a zero eigenvalue. So, I mean, the only reason we're getting exactly zero is because the other one is infinitely far away. If it was, if the other, you know, how can you get, you can prove for any finite system uh, that the eigenmodes of HBDG have equal and come in pairs with equal and opposite uh, uh, values, opposite signs, equal magnitudes and opposite signs. Uh, that's true for any BDG Hamiltonian uh, of a finite system. But now we take an infinite system. Uh, and so then we can find uh, uh, a zero eigenvalue by its lonesome. Uh, because somewhere out there, infinitely far away, there has to be another one to pair it for it to pair up, which is just, of course, that's the case because no Vison can exist on its own, uh, at least on with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, if you don't, if you have only one Vison in an open boundary condition, then there'll be some other state sitting on the edge of the sample that will make up the partner to this one. Okay. Uh, so we just have to hit this thing on some wave function, but what about the branch cut? Well, the branch cut is very easy to implement. It just means that your wave function, when you go around by two pi, uh, picks up a minus sign. So it's like a spin and a half particle. If you rotate it by two pi, it's going to come back to negative of itself. So that's the boundary condition that the Vison imposes from the Vison. And that turns out to be the key. Uh, so now let's just satisfy the boundary condition uh, just by putting these factors of e to the i theta over two and e to the minus i theta over two uh, with the g1 and g2. Um, and now you take this wave function and you hit it with this uh, this operator uh, and you get a two by two, two set of equations uh, which are right here. And, and actually, again, you can play with these equations and see that uh, for every eigenvector capital E, there's another eigenvector uh, with energy negative E. You just have to interchange G1 and G2, you'll get the other one. But now you ask the question, is there, a, is there something precisely at zero energy which doesn't have a partner? Or more properly stated, whose partner is at the other end of the sample, far, infinitely far away? Uh, and the and the remarkable answer is yes. This is, these are very easy equations to satisfy. The right hand side is zero, and, and of course things have been cleverly worked out so that this equation is the same as that equation. Uh, g1 equals g and g1 equals g2, uh, and this is the solution. So there's some solution depending on mu and r delta of r. There's always exactly one operator which decays exponentially from the center of the uh, uh, center of the Vison, uh, which is present. So, so here's then I have so you saw so here's an explicit expression, and now you can write down uh, this Majorana operator, uh, which is basically, you know, this component times f. So this this the up component will multiply f, and this the down component will multiply f dagger. Uh, you put in all the factors, and there it is. So f of r theta is just the fermion original. Lattice fermion operator at point R and angular uh, coordinate theta. Um, and you just integrate this and you've got your answer. And, and you can see that this gamma is equal to gamma dagger. Okay. So, so that's the, that's as much of a proof as I'm going to give. <laughs> There's a, you know, it proves it in a certain situation with uh, circular symmetry, but okay. Uh, then you can start. Uh, you know, thinking in topological terms, because you can see that once you have this for circular symmetry, we have just one eigenmode, all by its lonesome, and the other one is infinitely far away. Uh, well, if you make a few small changes here, this this special eigenvalue at zero can't just move away, you know, because all the other eigenvalues are paired and they can start moving away or moving around as you make some changes to the Hamiltonian. Uh, because the eigenvalues come in pairs, E and minus E. But the one that's at zero energy is all by its lonesome. Uh, it can't move away because uh, e, e equals zero is the only energy at which you can have an eigenmode which doesn't have a partner. Since it has no partner, it's never going to find a partner unless you bring the other bison close by. So from that argument, you can see that 
okay, once you found it, it's, you can't get rid of it without bringing the other wise on it. You can make all kinds of changes locally, it's still gonna stick there. Okay. <laughs> all right, so, so that's, uh, that's what happens here. So the, the, what we call the Vison, we should now stop calling the Vison because it's really quite a different object. Uh, the Vison used to be called the M particle. Uh, and now we're going to call it the Sigma particle. Uh, and the Sigma particle, roughly speaking, is a bound state uh, of a Vison and half uh, a fermion. Whereas, of course, we remember that the bound state uh, of uh, a Vison or an M particle and an epsilon particle, which is a full fermion, uh, would be uh, an E particle in the Z2 gauge theory. So now we don't have the E particle around to kick around anymore. We just have uh, the epsilon particle, which is F, the fermion, and we have the sigma particle. And that's it. And that's, in fact, the full content, any on content of this particular phase of, uh, of matter. Um, yes, so Juwan has a comment. In the literature, sometimes people call one the half quantum vortex for a spin full fermion orbit or single. So, would you call the branch cut going from zero to pi half quantum? How is this quantum? High flux. Okay, uh, so I think Juwan's question, which you can see on chat, uh, really has to do with what happens when you think of this uh, as a physical superconductor where the Fs are. Uh, actual electrons and don't carry any Z2 gate charges. Uh, then this thing is a, yeah, I don't know why they call it. Um, it's, um, I mean, my understanding, is, okay, yeah, I, I don't know the notation. It's, it's a field called the half quantum vortex with a spin full for me an hour. Well, it's it's, it's uh, so the vortex here is a pi flux for the spin on. It's a pi flux for the F, uh, which is exact. I mean, it's just like a regular BCS vortex, really, except it's spinless. Uh, so it's it's a pi flux for the spin on, but it's a two pi flux for the for the pair field. Uh, so the spin on would pick up a phase of pi as you go around. Uh, and that's why you have this minus sign here. Whereas the pair field is a square of psi, so it wouldn't have the minus sign. Uh, so that's so, part sorry. of And also I'm referring here to the Z2 gauge theory where this question doesn't even arise. That's why I'm using the word Vison because that's what it is in the Z2 gauge theory. There's no, there's no vortex uh, in a Z2 gauge theory other than the Vison. Uh, can I just say the equation 28 indicates the there's a pi flux when fermion goes to this. Yes, pick up correct. A, so this type. And, and that's why I say, I think that when I write there are some correction, I didn't type this way. When I say operator, actually I mean superconductor, somehow I correct to operator. Anyway, so uh, you can disregard when I say operator, it means, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, let, let me just also reiterate that I'm not talking about P wave superconductors here. I'm talking about an insulating spin system which has a rather bizarre spin liquid phase. And in that case, the F operators are not electrons, they are spin-ons which, which carry a Z2 gate charge. Now there's a different physical system which also has some of this structure and that's a P plus IP superconductor, not an insulator, P plus IP superconductor of electrons. Uh, and the abricots of vortices in that superconductor also harbor Majorano modes. So, but that's not a topological phase in the strict sense because it's not even gapped to begin with. Uh, and it has various abelian uh, phase factors that you can't predict ahead of time when you braid the, braid the vortices. Uh, on the other hand, um, yeah, so it's it's a, you know, but people still uh, like it, and they may be uh, of, you know, if you only focus on the non-abelian factors, uh, it would, 
it would be useful to work it out. So, so the, the, the superconductor example is experimentally more accessible, which is why there's a lot of excitement to find it. But it's strictly speaking, not a topological phase of, of the type that I'm discussing here. Okay, just a caveat, just to keep in mind. All right, so what is the exciting property? The exciting property, as I've stated earlier, is non-abelian statistics. Okay, so, and uh, the basics of it can be actually explained uh, surprisingly simply. Uh, when it was first discovered, it was seemed horribly complicated, but eventually Ivanov gave an argument which really at least clarified the fog for people like me. Uh, and uh, so you don't need any fancy conformal field theory and all kinds of other things to figure it out. Uh, it's just, as you'll see, just a simple consequence of two things, two things you have to understand. One uh, is that each physical complex fermion is shared by two vortices, not one. And the other uh, is that uh, coming from each sigma particle, let's call it that now, uh, is a branch cut. That's all. That's all you really need to know. From those two facts, the basic non abelian statistics uh, can be derived, as I'll now show you. Okay, so let's consider two n well separated Vizons. Uh, so I have four of them here. One, two, three, four. Okay, so how many complex fermions do I have? So the number of complex fermions, or so the number of two level systems, or the number of qubits, fermionic qubits, is two to the n over two which in this case is four. Happens to equal the number of uh, vortices, but that's just an accident, of course. All right. So now what I've said is that there is, a, when you have four of them, uh, there is a Myron a zero mode associated with every one of them. Uh, but that each Myron on its own doesn't give us any physical quantum states to operate in. So to define the quantum states, I have to pair the Majorana up in some way. And exactly how I pair them up is arbitrary. Uh, it's up to me. There's some complicated state here of that's the system is forming uh, out of these four states. So your actual physical state, uh, when you have an experimental realization of four of these, is some linear combination of these four states in the Hilbert space. So basically what I need is a, is a basis uh, of these four states, basis that describes uh, these four states, and I can just take different linear combinations there. So to find a basis, I arbitrarily pair them up. So I'm going to pair them up with gamma one with gamma two and gamma three to gamma four. I mean, of course it makes sense if two of them are close to each other that you may want to pair them up. Uh, so let's just imagine that, you know, I'm going to pair up gamma one with gamma two and gamma three with gamma four. And so this will give me two complex fermions, uh, which I'll call eta one and eta two. Okay. Uh, but I could have made other choices, but this is just a choice that I just will make. And I, as long as you understand the choice, then you just have to stick with it and make sure that all the phase factors are consistently evaluated in the same basis vector. That's the that's the only subtlety really. Okay, right. So here's the expression written out in general uh, for general n. So you have two n vortices. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Okay, that's a typo there. That should be two to the n. So you have two n well separated vortices. So n is going to be two for us. So that the four vizons. Uh, that's the simplest non-trivial case. Uh, and so I have N uh, complex fermions, and these are my two to the N states, uh, with as N sub S goes from zero to one. So those are those are my states, and I just pick those states and say, okay, there, those are my, that's my basis. Okay, uh, and as I said, um, uh, associated with this basis, a set of Majorana fermions localized near the vortices, uh, and I and I do it exactly like I showed in the picture, uh, 
the first complex fermion goes to the first two Majorana vortices, and the second complex fermion eta two goes to the next two. And this is just the more general way of writing that out. Okay. All right, so now I have uh, defined my Hilbert space. Uh, what's new now, which we didn't have before when we were talking about, uh, you know, Laughlin quasi particles and all the other quasi particles in the abelian case, is if you had a set of quasi particle, the, the set of quasi particles previously didn't define many states. There was just one state. There was just just one many body wave function that described these three quasi, these, you know, whatever set of quasi particles you had. But now, if I give you six quasi particles, my wave function is not just a single wave function. My wave function has two to the three, eight components. And what I can do is by moving these particles around each other, I can do unitary transformation on those eight components if I had six, six uh, particles. So all I really have to figure out now, what is the unitary transformation? So the basic operation that people like to work out here, uh, people call it braiding. Uh, so braiding is sort of like exchanging where you just think in terms of projecting the two dimensional uh, situation and the uh, two dimension uh, configuration of the particles and project them on a line. And the braiding is something interchanging two of them anti-clockwise uh, something called a braid group, and what we're really working out is a representation of the braid group. So, you know, you can read about all of this in great detail uh, in, I think, many, many papers, uh, including this reviews of modern physics article that uh, how you uh, mentioned on the on Slack. So I'm just going to do the very simplest operation, where simplest braid, where gamma one uh, is going to go to gamma two, and gamma two is going to go to gamma one. So that's the simplest element of the braid group. Just to interchange two neighboring particles in, in this, and the orientation does matter. And notice the orientation matters because I also have to choose an orientation for the branch cut. So I have this branch cut and I choose an orientation for the branch cut, that's a gate choice, uh, all heading uh, in this upward direction. Uh, and that's going to, you know, that particular choice, the fact that the branch cuts are heading upwards, uh, is going to change the explicit operations that I get. Uh, but again, you know, that's a gate choice. And what I care about are the commutation relations between the operations, and those won't matter. So, but so I've just picked a gauge where these all go this way. So once I pick the gauge and I move gamma one there and gamma two there, what I notice. Uh, is that gamma one, uh, let's see. So as gamma one is moving there and gamma two is moving there, gamma one is going to cross the branch cut of gamma two. They just, you know, as they come here, the branch cut will be here. And so gamma one is going to cross the branch cut of gamma two. So it's going to pick up a minus sign. Whereas gamma two is not going to cross the branch cut. Uh, it doesn't hit gamma one's branch cut because we are going in this anti-clockwise way, and and the branch cuts go up. If you're taking the branch cuts down, of course it'll be opposite. So therefore, I have this very simple, uh, uh, simple effect of this braiding operation. When I braid the operation, gamma one goes to minus gamma two because it picks up a minus sign, whereas gamma two goes to uh, gamma one. Okay, so this is how the operator, so think of gamma one and gamma two that is some operator that acts on this Hilbert space uh, of these anions. It's a four dimensional Hilbert space with four, with four anions. And gamma one and gamma two are different operators that act on the Hilbert space, on the states. Now I'm not so interested in the operators, I'm actually interested in the states. So I need a unitary transformation which acts on this operator uh, and gives me uh, this transformation because then that will be the same operation that will act on the states themselves. So in other words, I want to find an operator U12, which when acting on gamma one gives me gamma minus gamma two, and an operator U1, the same operator acting on gamma two gives you gamma one. Okay, so you can figure it out. 
you just have to find some operators between gamma one and gamma two that obey this given the relation, and this turns out to be the the operation. So now U one two is some operator acting on these four states. The four states are n one and two, which are eigenstates of eta one and eta two, which are related to the gammas by this way. So really, I have all I have full information now on what what would happen to any arbitrary state in the Hilbert space. It will just be acted on by this operator. And you know, and the action of this operator on those states are, are you know very simple to work out because you just express gamma one and gamma two in terms of eta one and eta two, and everyone knows how fermion operators act on the fermionic states. Okay, so that's U one two. Uh, and similarly, uh, you can write down an operation for U two three, which will be one plus gamma two gamma three, and you can write down an operation for U three four. Uh, notice I'm not writing down an operation for U one three. That's going to be more complicated because it's going to involve gamma two and various other things coming in. Uh, but it turns out you can work out those by the uh, by the braid group relation. In, in the braid group, you can always relate interchanges of nearby operators to interchanges of faraway operators by successive interchanges. So once you have U12, U23, and U34, you can multiply them to get anything else, any other member of the braid group. Okay. So, uh, so I looked up in uh, Alessia's paper. He helpfully has worked out what is the action of U12 on this Hilbert space, N1, N2? So you make a basis choice. A basis choice is to pair the first two and pair these two. So in that basis, the action of U12 is very simple. It's just some phase factor, which depends on N1 and N2. And in the action of U34 is also just a phase factor. So, so far, we haven't seen anything anything shocking or anything we haven't seen before we just seen it we're just saying it picks up some phase factor which is what happens in the boolean statistic but the the new thing is what happens uh for u23 so for u23 and you know what's special about u23 is because we chose a basis with, with these two fermions we chose a basis with these and these two myronas and now we're interchanging half so we have some fermion eta one sitting here, we have a fermion eta two sitting here, and by interchanging two and three, we are not interchanging fermion one with fermion two. That would, of course, just give me the fermion sign. We're interchanging half of this fermion and half of that fermion. <laughs> That's the remarkable thing. You have these fermions eta one and eta two, and you can interchange half of them. And when you interchange half of them, you get uh, uh, some kind of rotation in this four dimensional space. So there's the non-abelian factor. You get a matrix, not just a phase factor. You get a matrix that rotates in this four-dimensional space. Um, so you can write down what this matrix is. It's right there. And then now you can figure, work out that, you know, this U12 doesn't compute with U33 and so on. You can get all kinds of uh, group relations. And, and then from those group relations, uh, you can compute, in principle, something. Okay, I mean this particular uh, set of uh, braiding relations are, are not uh, what's it called? They, you you can't get any arbitrary unitary transformation out of it, so they're not uh, complete in some sense. So you need a more complicated topological order to get something complete, as far as I know. Anyway, okay, right. So so that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, so the key point was that you were able to exchange half a fermion with half of one fermion with half of another fermion. You're allowed to exchange them uh, just by 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 doing this braiding operation. Um, what else have I said? Yeah, so you, there's also fusion rule if you care about such things. Uh, this tells you what happens when you, in the analog of something we met a long time ago in the uh, Z2 spin liquid tells you what happens when you bring two anions and close to each other. So uh, what 
kind of anyone does that look like? So if you take two spin-ons, F and F dagger, uh, well if you, uh, or F and F, if you bring them close to each other, you basically get the trivial anion because uh, the whole thing is fermion parity uh, even, and there's no fermions left over anyway. Uh, and you're only measuring fermion number modulo two. Um, <clears throat> what happens when you bring an epsilon with a sigma particle, which is this Majorana zero mode vortex? Uh, well, you, you, this each sigma particle has half a fermion in it, and you bring another fermion in, basically all it does is change the fermion parity. So it, it does a rotation between these two states, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that you have still a sigma particle there. And finally, what is sigma cross sigma? Well, a sigma cross sigma, as you've seen, uh, is this two level system uh, of fermionic states, one above and one below. Um, and you can think of them, the even the state that has even fermion parity as the trivial state and the one with the odd fermion parity as the epsilon state. So this is the non-trivial fusion rule of the kind that we didn't have before, uh, telling you that uh, there's a two-dimensional Hilbert space when you have two sigmas next to each other, right? Not which is the which are these uh, two complex fermions. So you can think of them when the complex fermion is absent, that's the one state, and when the complex fermion eta is present, that's the epsilon state. Okay. I think um, that's all I have to say. So that's your introduction to um, non abelian statistics and Ising topological order. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to say, and uh, there's just a lot of papers uh, on this topic, uh, and even some experiments. So no one, you know, people have now managed to, it seems, have pretty good sign of a myron or fermion at the end of a wire. Uh, the next step is to actually braid them by somehow moving the wires around or moving voltages on them in some interesting way. Uh, and uh, But people are trying to do it. I don't know how close they are. I, I suspect it's going to be another another decade or so before anybody manages to braid these, but you never know. There might be some surprises. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, so as I, I think this is partly related to Juwan's various comments, uh, which are mostly above my head. Uh, but it's, there's also an abelian phase factor here when you interchange the Majorana fermions, which is not fixed for a P wave superconductor, which is why Alasia doesn't discuss it. Uh, but Kitev does discuss it because Kitev is not talking about a superconductor, he's talking about an insulating insulator spin liquid. Uh, and in the insulator spin liquid, which is an actual topological phase, uh, there's an abelian phase factor, which is also totally fixed. I mean, just like in a Z2 spin liquid, you know, we had a phase factor when you move uh, an E particle around an M particle, which was minus one. It was just fixed to be minus one. There's a, there are similar phase factors here. Uh, and in the non-abelian case, they tend to be called, rather than in calling the statistical angle, they call the topological spin. Uh, and I don't fully understand exactly how you determine the topological spin of a vortex, and it's got some strange factors involving the eighth root of unity associated with it. Uh, and uh, I think but Hayu is going to give some argument for that tomorrow, if I understand it right, not tomorrow, next week on Tuesday. <laughs> Okay, that's really all I have to say, and I'm open to questions. I'm not going to start a new topic today. Uh, we'll just then go on to dualities uh, on Friday. Uh, questions? I can make a comment, can I, Subia? Please, please go ahead, Julian. So as, it, as, it, as you say, actually, this is a fact. I also don't have a good intuition. Maybe you were also mentioned just earlier. You know, the matrix, the unitary matrix you write on U1 to um, in equation 36, if I believe, 36 or 37. Yes, this one, 
or exon two dimensional Hilbert space of two Murana. And uh, right. and I also write there is that uh, this property if you check uh, the the u one to to the power force will give you minus one, and which minus one x on both bosonic and fermionic ground state, while ace will be plus one. So you do not see any phase which is uh, two pi i over uh, over sixteen, but but, it, but this phase will be the phase when you try to uh, understand the uh, self statistics or exchange statistics of the sigma anion. Or here will be the Marana. They should give this uh, two pi over sixteen, and mm -hmm. and that's a theory that, that they should produce. But it's not clear from uh, this nice example. So I was trying to see how far away, how far the condensed matter intuition can go. And you you introduce very nice. I also derived this thirty six. But just from here, it seems like still cannot produce this phase of over sixteen, and which is important for the sixteen four way of Kitab. So 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 there's a still some conceptual. Uh, maybe a, a, a gap between understanding the one over 16, the phase, two pi over 16 phase uh, from this argument. It's, it's not clear uh, to me. Even. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you completely. You can't, this is, the, this is just a partial argument, uh, which is easy to give, which is why I gave it. I think uh, the argument for the phase factor either involves um, knowing something about chiral conformal field theories, which somehow it's related to the to the topological spin of the Ising operator in, a, in the C equals one half conformal field theory, uh, or knowing all about these uh, braiding matrices and the Pentagon rules and all of that and looking for consistency there. That's my understanding. If you work through all of that, you can get this one's this phase factor, but it's a complicated argument, which uh, I fully agree I have not presented. And uh, I just felt it was just too technical for, for, for this for this course. Yes, I agree. So, 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 so I also admit I don't have a good uh, understanding on the one of sixteen other than formal argument. Ba based on this intuition, I, it seems some, somehow still cannot get get a face. But uh, but yeah. the, the reality is that such face is is there, and can it seems cannot be seen from just putting maybe multiple of Marana and braid them and try to see. But in principle, it seems it should be. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what else. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the argument which I can, which is to me, it seems most approachable uh, is, you know, there is, uh, there is this connection between uh, uh, braiding operations and, and braiding operations of conformal blocks of conformal field theory, uh, which you can establish from, you know, from, from John Simon's gauge theory. So once you have that connection, then you can see uh, that from the Ising operator in the conformal field theory, there is this there is this factor. Uh, so that's one way to see it, I suppose. <laughs> there may be others, but that's the one that, at least in my background, I could hope to follow someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe let me say one thing. I hope maybe people will like to hear is, is that so? Uh, is this system uh, actually? Sorry, I was looking at the chiral P wave superconductor. I'm not sure whether this will be the same system you look at. But presumably the the statistics are same, and uh, no, no, no. This one sixteenth factor is not present for a chiral view of superconductor. It's not. It's only present for the IT or the Ising topological order field. Uh, yes, but but that would be the the same if you try to gauge the the make the the vortex of P plus I be dynamical. Well, that's the same thing as as making a spin liquid. Yeah, you can think uh, of a. Okay. You can think of a spin liquid as a superconductor coupled to a Z2 gauge field. I mean, that's you to to do that in real life. You have to have a spin liquid. Yes, that, that I agree. Okay. And yeah, and yeah. So so you change the sorry. This will be a bit technical, but let me just say. So the P plus IP superconductor is known as a spin icing T of T. And if you try to gauge it, the, the 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 make the vortex dynamical. And this process will uh, give you uh, icing TQFT. And in Spears yeah. lang super languages, uh, couple to Z2 uh, spin liquid. Okay, right. so so then if you look at the boundary of this uh, this uh, TQFT or this uh, this this uh, system, you'll get the uh, chiral Marana vial formula in one plus one D with chiral central charge one half. Yes. And you can compare this to multiple layers of this system. And you'll find that if you mod multiply this system by 16 times, you can get a yeah. 16 times one half, which is Carlson charge eight. And that can be realized as a purely bosonic 
呃、uh, gap quantum hole system known as the EA quantum hole with central charge A. And this yes. CFT on the boundary is turned out to be a fully modular invariant. So that's a good mm. property. So if you compare this, the central charge eight, the, which is a bosonic one with the, the minimum from any one, one C, C equal to one, central charge one half, is exactly the 16 phase. And then yeah. based on some formula argument, argument, you can argue that the uh, EA quantum host state doesn't have any anion in the bulk. So the, the, the T matrix or the, the, the self statistic phase must be plus one. And the one over 16 one will be the phase for this IC anion. So this is probably the, the most intuitive I can say, but the, it's still not very transparent. And I think the, the most close one I was inspecting the equation 36 you show is very close, but not exactly right. And there are a lot of formula argument or, or even some hand waving argument, but I don't feel like anyone is getting this uh, intuitive nerve. And okay. the most see this is the one you show anyway. All right, thanks. Yeah, no, good point. Uh, I should just also note in my defense that I do say in the text, if you read the text, that uh, yeah, that, that this uh, these operations here are missing uh, topological spin. So this is a there is an I say that here. There's an additional non-abelian abelian phase factor so the topological which we ignore. So yes, I agree. This is not completely correct, and I, I said that here. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, thank you for all your insights. Yeah, I think uh, how you will uh, has some way of understanding it that you'll talk about on Tuesday. Uh, and I hope you're also looking at the homework problems and uh, <laughs> and uh, can bring up your questions uh, either with how you or Darshan in the various office hours. And hope you're making progress on your presentation too. <laughs> so. All right, so we have uh, four more lectures by my count. Uh, and in those four lectures, I'll talk about dualities and try to apply dualities to learn more about various complicated phases of matter. Um, four is really not enough to cover that in any detail, uh, but I'll, I'll try to get at least cover some reasonable part of it. Uh, actually, I'm also writing up some notes on dualities and they will cover a lot more than I will be able to cover in class. Okay, so see you tomorrow morning at nine if you want further discussion and uh, also um, uh, if not on Friday. <laughs>